Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Kim Havens. I'm the event manager here at An Unlikely Story. I'm upstairs in our third floor, Wimpy Kid World, in the airplane fuselage. So it is now nighttime. We are going to talk about sleep and the science of sleep with Heather Darwell-Smith. We are delighted to welcome her here this, this evening. Heather left behind a career in the design industry to become a qualified psychotherapist. With an MA in mindfulness-based core process psychotherapy from Middlesex University, she is now working towards a PGDIP in sleep science at the University of Oxford. Heather also has a diploma in counseling and psychotherapy from Bath Center for Psychotherapy and Counseling, and is the founder of What is Stress, a stress management program that combines workshops and one-on-one -on -one coaching. And when your camera does not work on your computer right before you have an event, that is stress. Alongside her work as sleep therapist at the London Sleep Center, Heather runs a private practice in Oxford. Heather specializes in issues such as trauma, addiction, and PTSD, and particularly how they can present as challenges to sleep. This work directly supports her ongoing research into insomnia and other sleep conditions. Heather believes that the path to well-being lies in a good night's sleep. An important part of her ongoing clinical research addresses the cyclical questions, what comes first, poor sleep or poor mental health. Heather's book, The Science of Sleep, which I have right here, you are going to want a copy because she is in England. We do not have um, book plates, but you are still gonna want it. It's based on questions she is asked daily and is structured to help you understand and transform your sleep habits one night at a time. It's easy to understand, easy to follow, and is both entertaining and informative. Are you a night owl or an early bird? Can you change from one to the other? Why do you get that feeling like you're falling right before you go to sleep? These are some of the many questions that Heather answers in the Science of Sleep, and I know she'll cover many more during the event. And we welcome your questions. You can go ahead and ask them in the chat. We will get to as many as we possibly can because, you know, we all want to know how we can fall asleep. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to welcome Heather Darnell Smith, Darwall Smith. I'm so sorry, Heather. That's okay. Excellent. Hi, Hi everyone. How are you doing? Um, it's, it's very late here in the UK. So it's, it's midnight here. Um, I think it's 7 p.m. for you guys there. So the irony that I'm speaking to you at this time of night about sleep does not escape me. Um, it's great to see that so many people have joined the, joined the session. Um, so it's really important if people can start to put some questions into the chat, because what I really want to do is shape what I'm here to talk about tonight and really answer what what it is you want to know, if there's specific things that I can answer. Um, so hopefully I can see the chat and I'll be able to respond to yeah. it. Um, will that work okay, do you think? I think it does, yes. I don't see any questions there yet. Um, but I guess I will start with this one. This was so fascinating is I'm always a night owl and my husband is always up to the crack of dawn. <laughs> is that something ingrained in us or is that something you can change? That's a great way. It's a great one to find um, find it in a relationship where one person is very much a night owl and one person's a, a lark because you sort of wonder, well, when do you actually see each other? Um, so that we when we think about um, that, it's, it's called our chronotype. So it's it's our inbuilt genetic um, preference for sleep timing, and. It, as a rule, we had sort of the, the extremes of the night owl and the morning lark. Um, most of us fit somewhere in the middle with sort of intermediates and we have a sort of um, regular um, timing that fits with societal timing, if you like. But then there are those of us who really are at either end of the spectrum. And it is genetic. Um, we do need to work with it. And as I say, if we're in the middle of it, we can put a little bit more tolerance. But if you really are a very strong night owl or a strong lark, then you really do need to work with that rhythm because otherwise you can really come quite up against it. So if you're a, if you're a morning person, getting up bright and breezy first thing in the morning, um, seven o'clock in the morning, probably up and ready to go. But if you're a night owl, that is going to be hard work. 
So you can work with it a little bit, you can shift it a little bit and the sleep need does change as we age. So when we're kids, we tend to be um, a bit all over the place. When we're adolescents, quite a lot of adolescents are real night owls. They're really late types. And then as we get older, we tend to head more towards morning types, but there is that underlying preference. So we can't necessarily change that preference. We can work with it um, and then tailor what we need based on what the sort of external need is, school, work, college, whatever that might be. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Thank you. And now Becky has entered a question in the chat. Okay, I can't see it. Oh, where, how do I see that? If you hover over the top, let's see. Let's see. There should be a little arrow there that says, um, oh, view options maybe? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. View chat. Do you see a little Ooh, box at the bottom? Yeah, yeah I can see. Okay. That's a really great question. Pandemic related sleep problems, will they last forever with the new variants coming at us all the time? One of the things we've definitely seen um, over the past 18 months is an escalation in sleep issues. But sleep issues were always there in the first place and they will, all, they will always be there once the pandemic's over. So I like to think about the pan what the pandemic has brought is sort of a, a um, global anxiety, if you like, and anxiety and sleep are not good bed partners. So I think that's partly where, why there's an increase in issues because we're all experiencing, we're in this mix of the chaos that's being caused. Um, so that sort of generalized insomnia, anxiety-based change that's happening to sleep will continue, but it will, it ha it all, will always ebb and flow. The thing that we are seeing certainly in the clinic is um, changes to sleep patterns with, with people who have co had COVID and long COVID and we don't quite understand why yet as to what's happening. Um, so what new variants might bring to the sleep cycle, we don't know because we don't quite understand what's happening right now. But we do know that in any context, pandemic or whatever, when there is a lot of anxiety in the mix, sleep is the thing that gets affected because our routines and our patterns go up the wall. Um, often a lot of people when they're experiencing a lot of anxiety have very vivid dreams. So sometimes their um, sleep is not quite so refreshing. So there's a whole mix of things going on um, and sleep problems will always be there. But we, have, we are experiencing a real blip right now as to there is an increase. Um, hopefully it won't continue to escalate. So I hope that answers that question. So do do message and say yes or no. That would be really useful. Um, but um, just seeing the next question from Robin. Um, I work with parents of young children. How do you talk to them about the importance of sleep to development? It's a it's an interesting one. Um, sleep. I don't personally work with children. Um, I work above 18. I'm not licensed to work under 18. Um, and parents with children, I mean, some children are great sleepers and some children just aren't. Um, most children are sort of under the domain of their parents until they become teenagers where they decide actually now we're going to do our own thing sleep wise. And that's the subject of many a conversation in many a household, mine included. Um, and I can't quite, I think children don't sort of tend to join up well-being and the actions that they take and what the benefit can be to getting better sleep. So I know when you're trying to navigate this with teenagers, um, they, they are naturally late, late types. Children and teenagers tend to want to go to bed. If we want to go to bed about 10 o'clock, they tend to want to go to bed about midnight. That, that's their clock is actually working on a later timing. So we're then into a situation where we're trying to pull them backwards so they go to bed earlier. And I know um, my understanding is that in the States that kids go to school quite early. I mean, I have family in um, Boston and I know their kids go very early. And for teenagers, that's, that's really difficult because they're effectively waking up um, completely in deep sleep. So they're not functioning particularly well. Getting them to understand how important sleep is I sometimes feel like banging my head against a wall because they they don't want to sort of accept 
that they need to do this. They sort of know. Um, but there's also the other draw of they're not sleepy. That's one thing that's really hard. They're not sleepy. They're all online at night because that's what's going on. So there's also that aspect of actually, look, you need to go to sleep. This is going to do you some good. But then there's this, a fear of, well, all my friends are online. What am I doing? Why am I going to bed? So it's a very tricky conversation. So I really think about it in a sort of negotiation um, point of view as to if you get a little bit more sleep, you will feel better the next day and you will perform better and everything will be a bit easier. But it's how we can try to accept that teenagers especially have a late clock and have some elasticity around that um, because it's trying to meet them halfway and, and have that sort of joined up piece rather than trying to really push them to do what we want them to do because actually it's really difficult biologically for many teenagers not all but many teenagers that's that's troubling um, so hopefully that helps so these are great questions great we've got lots of questions now <laughs> yeah um so I get to sleep pretty easily and it takes forever to fall back to sleep this is something we see I see all the time so this this is if I um explain a little bit about the mechanics of how sleep works so three to four hours is a really typical wake up time so sleep works um in cycles we have between four and five cycles a night and each cycle is 90 to 120 minutes long um and as each of those cycles literally we're sort of going up and down into different types of sleep as we fall asleep we're in a really light sleep and our brain's quite alert and we drop down from stage one to two to deep sleep where we're really out really really very difficult to wake up from then we come back up to two to one and then into REM sleep, which is where most of our dreaming is done. And we continue on this cycle. The first half of the night, sort of the first three to four hours tends to be where we get most of our deep sleep, deep sleep. And the second half of the night tends to be where um, we get less deep sleep, but we get more REM sleep. So it's almost like a tale of two halves. So that waking that happens around three to four hours later is really common because it's almost like a break point in the sleep cycles, in the sleep type changing. Um, there's no, there's no sort of, um, everybody's pro cycle is different and we can't say, right, I'm going to get this much deep sleep and this much REM sleep. It's, it is what it is. Um, but then there's other aspects to this. So if, if we've got a lot of stress in our lives, then we go to bed and we have a lot of adrenaline and cortisol in the system. And then when we sort of get that sort of halfway point, what's also happening is the body is starting to think about waking up a couple of hours later. So it's starting to produce cortisol. And if there's already a lot in the system, you're now adding because the pulse is starting to wake you and it's pushing you up into wakefulness. And that's when it's really difficult to fall asleep at that point because the body is actually starting to try and wake. Um, so the piece there, is about how do I bring my stress levels down overall during the day so that I haven't got a heightened load at that point halfway through the night. And there's other aspects there. It could be um, age and as our sleep, our sleep needs change, um, we might be lighter sleepers. It could be that we're thirsty. It might be that we're hungry. There's multiple reasons for that waking. So when we think about the multiple reasons, we think, right, so the big one is stress and what then starts to run at that sort of time because we often it's, it's a horrible thing you lie lie there and you're awake and it's like what's going on i'm wide awake why am i awake and the whole anxiety starts to run why am i awake i can't get back to sleep and the moment that's starting to go then the stress is starting to rise again and then that's pushing it into it then becomes even harder to get back to sleep so my recommendation is tends to be um if after sort of 15 to 20 minutes, you're lying there and you're tossing and turning and getting agitated, it's not working. So get out of bed, go somewhere else in the house, sit maybe with a book with a low light or do something else, a jigsaw puzzle or a crossword, something that's distracting that will help you to get sleepy. The lights are low so that when you start to feel sleepy again, 
then you go back to bed because it's really hard to try and get yourself to go back to sleep if, you, if you're getting agitated. So it's like breaking that cycle. But for some people that actually getting up, the thought of getting up is quite stressful. So staying in bed and thinking about so during the day, if this is a pattern that you do quite a lot, um, think during the day about things that might help you in the night. So you have something prepared that night. So um, there's various, there's a really useful, um, it's like a meditation practice called progressive relaxation. Um, there's lots of recordings online and that's something that you can sort of plug in in the middle of the night. Um, it's a guided practice that works through your body like a sort of body scan that can help you to get back to sleep at that time without having to get up. So some people will prefer to stay in bed, some people prefer to get out and, and have that distraction piece. But the big point I think is um, not to lie there tossing and turning and getting stressed about it. Actually, breaking that cycle so that you can try not to worry about it because the next day, yeah, it might be bumpy. You've had a bad night, it might be bumpy. But you, you'll be okay. That's that's the thing. It's the, at, at that time of the night, everything's a catastrophe. Everything's a disaster. But actually, you'll be okay. So finding those tools during the day, um, what to do if you're going to get up, if you're going to stay in bed, is listening to a podcast going to work for you, is listening to doing some sort of breathing exercise. There's lots of different options out there. Um, and yeah, I could speak all evening about the different. <laughs> but hopefully, that's that's gives a little bit of a picture on that waking, and know that you're not alone as well. That's really important because when I do um, workshops, I'll say to the people, say to the group, what percentage of people in the room are awake between three and four a.m.? Seventy, eighty percent. That's really normal. So it's it's important to sort of normalize this process as to oh, okay, that's it's, I'm not. It's not something crazy going on. I'm okay. And there's different things that I can do. So hopefully that, that helps. Fingers crossed that helps. So it's really hard because, of course, I can't see you all. So I can just sort of talk and hope <laughs> hope that it's um, helping. So well, I know that was very helpful for me. Thank you. <laughs> I just can't what, I just can't look at the news. That's the way. Yeah. Yeah, I ban, I ban everyone from um, looking at the news from about 10 o'clock. I mean, really point blank, that's that's one of my sort of golden rules. Please don't look at the news. Yes. Please turn all social media off um, because it's there's two things about, about being on your device. There's the, the stimulation from the content, um, which regardless, that's what it does. It is a stimulant. And then, of, of course, it's, there's also the light aspect. And it's effectively, it's like shining a torch straight into the brain in the middle of the night. And your brain needs darkness. Our sleep-wake cycle is determined by light. We need loads of light in the morning and low light at night. And having light, that sort of level of light between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. is really not a good idea. It absolutely tells the brain it's time to wake up. So the devices have to be out of the picture here. And the news is a complete no-go. <laughs> that is a good one. I like um, Olivia's question too. Yeah. Any advice for dealing with vivid, stressful dreams that are unrelated to daily life? That's um, that's a big that's a big one. That's a big question. So, um, what we've seen huge numbers of people reporting an escalation in the experience of vivid dreams. Even people who were traditionally non-dreamers before the pandemic are reporting um, this process. And we think one of the things about it is. That again, when stress levels are high, dream dreaming happens in REM, predominantly in REM sleep. It does happen other other parts of the night, but the brain is in um, a very wake state. It's in a beta. Uh, the brain waves are sort of running at a beta level, which is the same as they are right now when we're awake. So the brain is very alert. It's very busy. So again, if there is that sort of heightened arousal in the system. They, we, we think that that's part of what's triggering that real vivid nature of um, dreaming. And for some people, I mean, me too, in, I, I'm very happy to share, I dream in full-on kaleidoscope vivid dreams and wake up the next morning, it's like, oh my goodness, I've had a party in the night. It's that real. It can be quite tiring. Um, and really random too, really, really random. So I think the, again, it comes back to the thinking about stress levels, thinking about how to relax before going to bed. 
thinking about the content that you're consuming in the evening too um, as to um, so that you're reducing the stimulation but also if it's something that's going on quite a lot it's something that is worth potentially um, seeking some support with a therapist maybe to just talk through a little bit of the content if that's coming up and it's distressing um, that can be very useful if, if the content is distressing but also other, other things things like keeping a dream diary can be really interesting because you can then get a sense of what's what's coming up and be able to process it in a more rational when you can write something down and see it you can sometimes make a bit more sense of it but when you're sort of left with the sort of tendrils of something that was quite stressful, then that can feel a little bit overwhelming. So it's a bit like taking out of here and putting it on paper and going, okay, yeah, okay, but I can step away from that. Not sure how we completely stop it. Some people are really prone to dreaming. Um, I can't, I've got the stat in my book as to the percentage of people um, who never dream. Some people never dream in colour. Um, it's really fascinating territory. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot of information out there. So it's, it's, it's something we could talk about all evening, like many things sleep, we could do that. So hopefully that, that helps. So, uh, okay. This one is from, from Laurie. Um, how do you feel, explain that feeling when one feels they're asleep and awake at the same time during the middle of the night? Happens to me a lot and I'm not sure if I should get out of bed or get bed to sleep it's not it's not confusing it's really common um really really common so it's a very interesting one when someone comes in and does a sleep study which is when they're sort of wired up and we there's uh, electrodes on your head and you can measure brain activity one of the things we can see is um that someone will appear to be asleep but the brain is very, very active. And that's the state that you're describing. It is, I, someone will wake up the next morning and say, I'm exhausted, I didn't sleep. And then we can say, well, actually, according to the EEG, you were asleep, but actually we know that the brain is really, really active. So you feel awake when asleep. So it is it is more common than you might think. Um, whether you should get up or not, the question is whether we know whether you actually know whether you are fully awake or not. Are you able to move? What's happening with that? Um, because thinking about awake and asleep at the same time, the potential is that you are asleep. So letting it pass and falling back asleep, hopefully that's possible. So it's not I'm not sure whether you're in full wakefulness or whether you're you're un, under consciousness. But it, it is a thing we do know. It's 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 um, the brain is very awake when it's asleep. Um, it tends to be a genetic thing as well. Um, it's it's a real sign of light sleep light sleepers, and I would probably think that you're probably quite susceptible to um, sound and light during sleep as well. Um, so it's really important to think about sleeping in real darkness, in real quietness, to help reduce that stimulation. So yeah, hopefully that that helps and hope hopefully that answers the question. It's again like everything. It's everything sleep is a big question, never simple. So um, okay, so Elizabeth's asking about melatonin. Um, now interestingly, melatonin here in the UK um, you can only get it on prescription. So we have quite different rules to melatonin usage here to you in the US. Um, and I have lots of patients who go to the US and they buy it and they bring it back. Um, is it safe to take it regularly? Well, I'm not a, I'm not a physician, so I don't prescribe. My colleagues prescribe. Um, if you think about what melatonin is, it's a hormone. Um, so I know that people do take it long term. I haven't seen issues with it in adults. It can be problematic in puberty because it can delay puberty. Some of the research in that area is, is very interesting. So being very careful about um, whether children take it or not. I have colleagues who will not prescribe for children and the only way they will prescribe for children is whether it's um, with learning um, 
neurodevelopmental conditions like ADHD and autism. So it's a very specific prescribing routine. But for adults, um, what it's doing, melatonin is, is a sleepiness hormone. So it's, it's a trigger to help you feel sleepy. It's not a sleeping pill. It's something that just helps you feel, helps the body to produce more of the melatonin, which we produce naturally anyway. Um, one way to increase our natural production of melatonin is by getting lots of light in the morning and low light in the evening, because that helps the melatonin production to maintain itself naturally. So say, take, is it safe? I don't personally have the answer on that because I'm not a physician. I do work with a lot of people who take it a lot all the time. Um, so I can't give you a, a direct yes, no on the safety. Um, but it is very, very commonly used with sleep. So if you've got concerns, it's worth checking that with a physician as to what's going on, because I know that there are some medications that it's contraindicated with. But equally, then I know um, for menopausal women, for example, melatonin supplementation is useful. So again, it's a very individual piece on that. Um, next question. So Kathy. I seem to get my second wind about nine and stay up till midnight. I have to get up early about 6.30, so I'm dragging in the morning. How can I get to sleep earlier without taking medicine? So let's think about this. So you go to bed at midnight. If you're sleeping right through from midnight to 6.30, um, that's pretty good. Um, I'd be quite happy with that. So if you think adults tend to need between seven and nine hours sleep on average, um, six and a half would be a little bit low. So it'd be ideal to get a little bit more. So I would work towards um, seeing if you can start to work towards going to bed more about 11 o'clock because 11 till 6.30 would be pretty good actually. Um, and it's what it depends what it is you're doing when you've got that second wind. Um, if you think about preparing for bed, do you have a bedtime routine? Do you make a sort of demarcation between this is the end of my day, I'm starting to wind down and prepare for bed. So it's things like an hour before bed, turning all screens off, lowering the lights, lowering stimulation. Um, think really thinking about I am getting ready for bed to set those cues up to help you get sleepy to go to bed. So with that, I would I would have a go at that before taking any medication, um, because if you are sleeping well, midnight to 630, being able to extend that sleep window should be relatively simple. But it's what you do in that time between nine and midnight, which really matters. So it's low stimulation. So for you, if you're going to bed at 11, it's like low stimulation from about 10 to really start to prepare the system. I am going to bed. It's like a retraining process to do that. Um, so thanks for that, Kathy. Um, so let's see, next question. I haven't got glasses on, so <laughs> I'm squinting a bit. Are regular short naps a good idea or counterproductive for a decent night's sleep? So napping. I'm, I'm very pro napping if you're someone who can nap. Um, I'm not pro napping if you're someone with insomnia. So I'm going to do a very end of checking time because I want to want to answer more questions. Um, very quick sort of how sleep works again. So sleep is two processes. You've got a circadian rhythm. So our body is a bunch of clocks and that bunch of clocks is set up by the master clock, which is in the brain, suprachiasmatic nucleus. And what happens in the morning, we wake up and we get lots of light and it tells that master clock to set everything up. And then the whole body works on this rhythm across 24 hours, which is set by light and dark. And it also works with meal times. It works with temperature. Um, and it, we have this sort of fluctuation. We have points in the day where we're very active and we've got lots of energy and we have points where we drop off. And that circadian rhythm um, works alongside a second process called um, adenosine, which is process S. So it's got process C and process S. And adenosine is a uh, molecule in the brain that builds up. And if you think about at night, we also over the day, we are saving up adenosine. We build up this pot of adenosine to spend when we go to bed. So with the circadian rhythm preparing us for sleep 
and our melatonin production starts and we build up this sleep pressure that adenosine builds in the brain and we get this sort of perfect joining up, the sleep gate opens and we go through. The thing about napping is that we're spending some of that adenosine. So actually, if you've got problems with sleep, you really want as much adenosine in the brain as possible to get you to go to sleep. So if you spend a bit napping, you've got less to go to sleep. Well, that does or doesn't matter. So if you're someone who is napping for 20 minutes between 1 and 4 p.m., 1 and 3 p.m., I'm not worried about that at all because um, it won't dilute the sleep pressure significantly. You won't get into having a whole sleep cycle, so you'll get the refreshing part of it um, without affecting your sleep. If you nap later, then you're going to start eating into your sleep. If you nap for longer, you really need to think about allowing a couple of hours so that you allow the body to potentially do a whole cycle. Because the issue with not doing that, it could well be that if you nap for say 40 minutes, you could fall into deep sleep. And then if you wake from deep sleep, you will feel rotten. It's, it just blows the whole point of having a nap out of the water. So, but if you have two hours, then of course it means it's going to squeeze your overall sleep needs. So you may only need to sleep for five or six hours that night. So it's personal, again, personal preference. Some people just can't nap. Some people do really well with a very quick short nap. Um, age matters as well. When we're younger, we need a lot more sleep. So you do tend to nap more. And then when we get older, partly because we get lighter sleep um, during the night, a top up of a, a nap in the afternoon can really help. But if there is no problem whatsoever in the picture at all about with sleep, then you know what? Take a take a quick 20 minute, half an hour nap in the afternoon as a reboot. Works for me. So yeah, go for it. Um, okay. So great, Laurie. Excellent. And um, I, I would expect you to say yeah, sensitive to light and things. Okay, so. Okay, so we haven't got more questions at the moment. So. No, so anyone has any more questions. So I really liked that part because I will go into a nap and I won't set the alarm. And if I just sleep, I'll just keep on sleeping. <laughs> yeah, and you really do need to be quite disciplined about it. It's like, right, I'm going to set the alarm half an hour, no more, because you really want to stop that falling into deep sleep. Um, and you don't want to spend the pressure. You want to save the pressure up for right. night time. So while we wait to see if there's um, any other questions, going back to the idea of sleep pressure, um, it's something that we build up naturally, but um, there is something in the world that really is very, very, very effective at blocking sleep pressure and that's caffeine. So, um, the way that adenosine works, it literally sticks to brain, um, sticks to areas of the brain to help us get sleepy. But caffeine sticks to those same receptors and blocks the aden adenosine. So caffeine is fantastically effective. It's the most abused drug in the world. It's so effective at keeping us awake, um, but it does block the adenosine. So we have to really think about our caffeine um, consumption as to if we've got, if we're someone who's got problems with sleep and we're consuming a lot of caffeine, you, it's a really vicious circle because it's blocking the sleep need. So of course it's difficult to get to sleep, but then the next day you wake up and you're feeling really drowsy and sleepy. So of course you reach for the caffeine because you're feeling drowsy and sleepy. So you're in this really tricky cycle. And you're also one of the things um, that I was really interested when we were putting the book together was um, finding a study where they did a, um, a, a study in the US, it's, I think it was done in California, where they went to a well-known um, coffee shop um, every day and got the same takeout coffee. And the amount of caffeine in that coffee was um, different every day. So actually knowing how much caffeine you're, you're taking on board can be difficult too. So I really, my recommendation is sort of 300 milligrams of caffeine a day and nothing really after 3 p.m. But again, it could be you're someone who's really sensitive and people tend to have an idea 
um because it, it'll be i feel quite jittery if you have too much caffeine um so people do tend to know but also we do build up tolerance to caffeine quite quickly and then of course there are the really strange mutants who have a different gene and they can drink caffeine 24 7 has no effect whatsoever doesn't stimulate doesn't block sleep but caffeine is a really effective um stimulant and blocks sleep pressure so it's important to really think about um our caffeine content content when we're thinking about improving our sleep timing matters it's got a long half-life so stopping earlier in the afternoon so it's got time to work through the system really helps so another <laughs> um great question any tips to deal with snoring husbands well um that's um i see a lot of patients they come into the clinic and we treat one part one part of the relationship for sleep apnea for snoring and we treat the other person for insomnia and this is a i laugh but actually it's a, it can be a serious serious problem really serious snoring is something that does tend to need to be checked out because it can be a sign of obstructive sleep apnea and apnea means that the brain um, is what's happening is that the throat is closing and it's starving the brain of oxygen so that sort of snore is a sort of splutter <coughs> to try and wake up to try and breathe again so um you obviously don't want to be depriving your, your brain of oxygen repeatedly over the night it's it's significantly bad for our health so that is always something worth having checked out and the the the, the stats on how many people suffer from sleep apnea it's it's really high it's sort of 50 60 percent um, at certain age groups and apnea can be treated and um, there's multiple different treatments that if you go to a sleep clinic they will work through with you so firstly i would always say get it checked there's different reasons for why why snoring might be happening it could be um, to do with weight if we've got a little bit more weight in us of course it's putting pressure on the neck which will help to close the um the throat down um, it can be genetics it can be jaw shape um so it's some people where the position of someone where someone's jaw is so wearing a mouth guard that's fitted by a, a specific dentist to open that up can really help um trying to get him to not sleep on his back really helps um because again it's that laying on the back that tips the jaw back that closes it down um so there there is a really um amusing idea of sewing tennis balls into the back of someone's pajamas to train them not to sleep on their back but don't know if that will work for you too um he might not appreciate that um so thinking about trying to sleep on your side but of course we we move all the time in our sleep so it's very difficult to maintain a position because actually we have to move and the body doesn't want to be in one position it's going to move um but for you yourself i mean it's really thinking about how is it affecting you do you need to wear earplugs um what's the impact on on the pair of you as a couple are you getting enough sleep because of his snoring so it's one of those questions that really does unravel quite quickly if snoring can be treated it's worth getting it treated because it's not good for your health and it's not good for the partner's sleep either so um i can be light-hearted and talk about snow throwing tennis balls in the back of your pajamas but actually it is something that's worth checking definitely so uh no matter how much sleep i get i'm still tired goodness that's a big one so that's when we get into the territory of um, sleep quality versus sleep quantity you can get um, seven hours of decent quality sleep and feel rested versus 10 hours of poor quality sleep and feel exhausted so the question would be what's affecting your ability to get good quality sleep and this can be all sorts it could be the environment in which you're in where it's difficult because maybe it's not quiet it's not conducive to good sleep um, there could be health reasons in the mix there could be it may be i don't know what's going on in your life but it's it's very much um, what we're look, always looking for is how to get good quality sleep um, so 
what I would do, I was thinking about how to do, I would think, say, keep a sleep diary for a couple of weeks to get an idea of the sort of picture of the, the timing of your sleep and get a sort of idea of what's going on across your day and see if you can see some patterns in there. Is there a, a consistent sleep wake time? Um, is there um, stuff going on at work or at school or whatever it may be that's quite stressful? So, so start to see if you can track um, any patterns in this to see um, what could be wrecking the quality of your sleep and then think about techniques to start to improve this. I mean, there's a million things, different things to do, but the sort of key pieces are getting up at the same time every day, getting lots of light in the morning and movement. Um, and then keeping a quite a, quite a, I don't like to be rigid, but quite a consistent sleep wake time. So if you, for example, you've got to get up at seven, think about bed at 11, winding down, allowing sort of good sleep hygiene techniques around this. So thinking about the wind down, thinking about reducing your stress level, thinking about reducing caffeine intake, alcohol intake, um, lots of things in that picture. So again, big one to answer, but the piece to really maybe do a little bit more reading information on is that difference between quality and quantity. I do talk about it in the book. I think I talk about it quite a lot because it's this is a big deal. It's a really big deal. But equally, it could be a sign of an underlying health condition um, because we do see when there's it, it, excessive daytime sleepiness is a marker for various different conditions. It could be diabetes, there could be depression, all sorts of different things. So keep a diary for a couple of weeks and start to get an idea of the sort of big picture. Um, Try and keep consistent sleep and wake time and think about your behaviours around sleep. But if it's not going away, then definitely seek help for that. Speak to your physician about it. OK, so. So, Suzanne, um, I was talking. So if you if at night, if you can't sleep, is it better to get up, lay in bed or get up and do something else? So I was talking about this earlier as to it's very um it's very personal. Some people find it really stressful to just lay in bed. Some people find it really stressful to get up. So, um, but ultimately, what is the worst thing is to lay there tossing and turning, getting frustrated and angry. And that's that's when it's important to break that loop, break that loop. That's when it is better to get up and do something else because it's very hard to get to sleep if you're lying there and you can't sleep and the, the world's just going over and over and over. So break that loop, get up, do something else and help yourself to get sleepy so that you're then able to return to bed. So you don't create an association with bed as being a place that I really don't want to be. It's got to be bed is for sleep. And actually we, we come out of bed to get ourselves sleepy again and then we go back again. So hopefully that, that helps. Okay. That's very good. Um, in the book, you talk about sleep hygiene. Can you mm -hmm. just kind of talk a little bit about that? I just thought it was fascinating. I'm like, sleep mm -hmm. hygiene. Mm -hmm. It's, um, I'm smiling because I, um, sleep hygiene is a um, sort of, a, it was a clinical term, I think that was developed in the 70s, 1970s around um, setting up structures for sleep research. Um, and I, I really, I don't like the term. It is the clinical terminology that's used um, because it's basically a set of um, general recommendations about lifestyle, um, stress reduction, diet, exercise, caffeine, um, alcohol, environmental factors, sleep, um, light, noise, temperature. So all these things that promote or interfere with sleep. Um, and sleep hygiene also um, involves in education about what's normal sleep and how sleep patterns change um, as we age. So the reason I don't like the term is because I sort of think it's clean or there's something about clean or wrong sleep. Actually, it's a framework of um, being able to maximize your sleep and just looking at all these different factors. But for some reason, they call it sleep hygiene. I just thought I had never heard of it before. I thought <laughs> yes. it was very funny. It's a funny term, so, isn't it? It is. So I'm going to jump on here for just a second because I found one of the most helpful things that you had is like the what sleep at different ages that you need. 
Yeah. That was fascinating because I'm, you know, at that in my early fifties. And so you, you're like, how much sleep do I really need? Do I, should I just get up? Because I will tend to just, I'm always one, I'll just roll over and go back to sleep. And I tried just getting up out of bed and I'm like, Oh, Oh, I'm awake. <laughs> so it is sometimes it's less stressful if you know how much you actually need. Um, so this has just been so great. And we're almost at an hour. So I thought I would wrap it up, but I just, I cannot recommend your book enough. And oh, I kind of feel you. like I went through it and I read all the parts, even like when you're trying to teach your child to go to sleep and routines. And I'm like, I think I might need to do that with myself. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I talk about that all the time. We, we, we are really good often at sort of really with very young children, really good structured behaviors. We will actively think we'll recognize, oh, my child gets overtired and things like that. We are no different. You could not. <laughs> we may think we're grown ups, but actually, if we if we apply that thinking to our own sleep process, we would sleep much better. We really yeah. would. It is. I just I thought I'm like, okay, wear the nice soft clothes and you know all the things and read a book and keep it all quiet and you know have your bath and I'm like, all right, I think I'm going to do that for myself. Um, well, it's about. I really like think of it as about comfort and pleasure. Um, I'm not some, I, I, I'm really not pro rigid routines because, hey, you've got to live. Um, and it may be that, yeah, keep trying and keep it as consistent as possible, sort of 80%, 90% of the time, but you've got, to, you've got to live. You've got to be able to go out with friends and not worry about whether that's going to affect your sleep. So it's very much, just, I've just seen a comment about mattress and pillow recommendations. It's very much about your sort of personal comfort and what feels nice. That for me, that really matters. Scent, sleep is really sensory. What feels nice? What smells nice in your environment? Um, some people, I mean, mattress and pillow recommendations. Some people love a really tough futon. Some people love a really squishy bed. Some couples work really well when they've got the beds that are sort of like two divans that one person likes a really firm bed and one person doesn't. Um, some people really like a memory foam mattress, but certainly women of a certain age won't because they'll store heat and you'll get very hot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, there are there are some really quite good mattresses out there which are quite cooling now. Um, and it's certainly if, if heat is a problem, you can get cooling mats. So it's like the opposite to a hot, hot blanket, you have a cooling mat. So some people like loads of pillows. Some people hate pillows. So. I don't ever recommend a specific mattress or things, but what I recommend is finding what you like and making it work for you. And if you're in a partnership, well, how do you how do you navigate that one? How do you both get your needs met? How do you meet in the middle on that one? So I'm yes. very pro personal choice, very pro finding what works for you. Yes, we have to get the mattress in the mail in the box to get it up the stairs, but I love going to the mattress store and trying them all out and we can do that again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, I can't recommend your book enough. Thank you so much. I think you reached out for Cassie. We put your book on the new, new releases and it did just come out. It's the science of sleep. And, uh, it's, it's so interesting. There's so many, I feel like we could have a whole other event on all the things that you talked about. And I, especially mm -hmm. the dreaming, conscious dreaming. I was like, yeah. Dreaming is a really cool subject. It's a huge, huge, huge subject. And um, it's not necessarily my speciality. It's something I'm very interested in. I, I, my, my thing is pr primarily insomnia and circadian rhythms, but um, it's very, it's very interesting world dreaming. Very interesting. Yes. And there's still so much we don't know. And that's the thing with sleep. We do not have all the answers. We really don't. It's a fascinating, fascinating world. It is. Oh, gosh. Thank you so much, Heather. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And thank you for interrupting your sleep and staying up till the wee hours with oh, us. Great. I'm always happy to um, to talk sleep. It's uh, my yes. passion. So but thank you for having me. It's great. There are a lot of good resources. So I would highly recommend to everyone to check out her website. Um, let's see if I can pull it up here. Uh, because you did, you just had so many great things on there. I was very interested. 
Yeah, I post quite a lot of stuff on Instagram as well. Uh, if you look me up on Instagram, Heather Doll will still. Um, yes. And yeah, yeah. So if just... people have got um, questions, if you want to email me, if I can answer, I will answer. So do feel free to do that. Excellent. Thank you so much, Heather. Have a okay. great night. And everyone, thank, have, you. thank you for joining us. All right. If you want to buy the book, just click the green button right at the center bottom. And we look forward to seeing everyone soon. Thank okay. you. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you, Heather. Bye. Good night.